Right, in the lab on Friday, I start talking about organic chemistry, and quick thing, on Wednesday, I'm going to do something different. On Wednesday, I'm going to be going through the acids and bases problem set in here. Normally, I do it in the lab, but if you look at the calendar, I'm running out of time, because uh, Thanksgiving, we lose two full days. One, the Wednesday lecture, because that Wednesday the schools close. And two, the Friday after Thanksgiving, the schools close. So I'm pretty good on schedule, but I do have to do it. All right, we're talking about organic chemistry. As I mentioned Friday, I teach here in another school a 16-week, one-semester course that's just a quick survey. So in a couple lectures, I'm not going to teach you everything about organic chemistry. But I'll teach you some important things that will be useful for the rest of your life and also help you do well on test number four in the final. By the way, test number four will be a little different instead of being on a Wednesday, because we don't have class on Wednesday before Thanksgiving. It will be the Monday after Thanksgiving and through the syllabus. All right. Now, the first thing when we talk about organic chemistry, which I mentioned on um, Friday, I was going to say Wednesday, but I did lecture on Friday, and that is that carbon is the most important element in the world on the periodic table, but I'm biased because I'm an organic chemist, and organic chemistry deals with molecules with carbon and hydrogen. And the first thing you should know when we practice on Friday, but I think we can do it once more now, is how many bonds to carbon. There's always four bonds to carbon. Does this look like it's coming right out at you, But anyways, class, how many bonds to carbon, everyone? Four. Oh, that was pathetic. Come on. I had a bad morning. Help me pick me up. Everybody, how many bonds to carbon? Four. four. Thank you. Remember that. There's always four bonds to carbon. And in organic chemistry, unfortunately, fortunately, there's very little math, but there's a lot of memorization. And you should know what is a hydrocarbon. A hydrocarbon is a molecule that has only carbon and hydrogen atoms in it. And I'm going through a little review that I did on Friday. But and there are two types of hydrocarbons you should know. One is saturated, and the other is unsaturated. Saturated, since the hydrocarbon has only carbon and hydrogen atoms, and it only has carbon-carbon single bonds. And unsaturated, that's a molecule, since the hydrocarbon, it has only carbon and hydrogen atoms, but it contains one or more carbon-carbon multiple bonds, which we call double or triple. And in organic chemistry, uh, which I didn't do earlier when we were doing Lewis structures, there you use dots for bonds. In organic chemistry, you use lines, sometimes <laughs> lines in for single bonds. So saturated and unsaturated, I've gone through this on Friday. Oh, by the way, one thing, apologize for Friday. Part of the lecture that I gave Friday, I didn't realize my camera angle, somebody's, actually more than one somebody's head was blocking the whiteboard. Halfway through, I realized it moved it. If I have it Friday, I'll know where to set it up properly. Now, switches off for this slide. There are different functional groups, and those in organic chemistry are molecules that have atoms that are in a group and they undergo the same kind of chemical reactions and have similar uh, reactivity. And I gave you this long list of slides offered here, but these are key functional groups. By the way, uh, it's time for you to find out I really am an organic chemist, and that's because Dr. White loves aldehydes and ketones They've been good to me, I've been good to them. And I love quaternary ammonium salts, because that's been very good to me, they've been good to me, and I've been good to them. Uh, 
aldehydes and ketones. That's what I did my PhD thesis on, which was a good thing. That would be my PhD. And quaternary ammonium salts, I think seven or eight of my patents yep. deal with that. So I might know a little, like I'm a world authority on those. And an example of a quaternary ammonium salt, uh, this will not be on a test, but Art in organic chemistry is like X and Y and Z in math, except instead of being numbers, it's just parts of a molecule that have carbon and hydrogen in it. And it can be 1 carbon, 10, 20. And this is a quaternary ammonium salt. And when two of these are 18 carbons and two are 1 carbon, guess what? That's your fabric softener. Next time you use a fabric softener, you're using a quaternary ammonium salt. I worked in that industry, so I know it quite well. And I worked for a company that made quaternary ammonium salts. And one of our, two of our biggest customers were Procter & Gamble, PNG, which makes downy fabric softener, and also uh, Unilever, which makes Stuggle. In fact, uh, because I worked for that company, Unilever found out about me and wanted me and hired me and made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I was working for another company. What was that offer? They doubled my salary. And guess what? Goodbye, new company. And functional groups react the same way, have the same, a lot of physical properties. Now, how to find the functional group switches on. If you look at an organic molecule, what you should look for is anything that's not carbon or hydrogen atom, or anything that's not a carbon-carbon single bond. Alright, I think everybody's done. 
ooh, an oxygen here, double bond to carbon. This is called a ketone. You don't have to know that. Ooh, a nitrogen. This is bonded to carbon. This is called an amine. But you don't have to know that. When I teach organic chemistry, they do the same thing, but they also have to know the names. And that's part of learning organic chemistry in a full semester, two semester course. Oh, let's do one more. These are fun. time this morning, circle the functional groups in that molecule. I think I threw everything in there but the kitchen sink. I think everybody's done. And look for what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, and what's not a carbon carbon single. Ooh, an oxygen. And this is called an ether. Ooh, an oxygen. So this carbon, another oxygen. And this is called an ester. Are we done? No. A carbon carbon double bond. How can you tell a double bond? A double bond is two lines, a triple bond is three lines. And this would be another. It's called a double bond. And those are all functional group, and they have separate chemistry that happens in that molecule. Now, I went through this, but it's good review how to draw, like I've been doing this, a molecule. And if we just stick to saturated hydrocarbons initially, you should know there are four bonds to carbon. And the question is, put the hydrogens in the following. Now we have this carbon. 
And how many bonds to carbon? I'll let you have 2.1 seconds. 0.1. And that would be three bonds. How many bonds should carbon have? Four. And therefore, that's how you put in the hydrogens. And that's an important skill in organic chemistry. So I'm going to let you try a couple. And why don't you try these two for your fun and enjoyment on this Monday morning. No, we didn't have any snow yesterday, maybe tonight. Didn't have any ice, so we're doing pretty good. Reminder, don't forget to do your extra credit project. Bring it in early to me, and I'll check it, or you can email it to me. Don't do it in a PDF, please, because uh, this way I can be a Word document, I can change it. If you can do a PDF, I can figure your that too. One thing about the extra credit project I didn't mention, you should not share with another student, because that's called plagiarism. You should each do your own on your own. So please make sure you don't copy someone else's and hand it in as your own work. Uh, that's happened once or twice over the years, and I do what's in my soul. Does All right, let's get going. How many bonds to carbon? Four. And therefore, if I look at this carbon, one bond to it, four minus one, three. Same here. Same here. Now let's look at that carbon right here. How many bonds to carbon is there? Four. Four lines. Four minus four is zero. So I don't need to put a hydrogen there. Two bonds to that. Four minus two, hopefully it's two. I have this carbon, one bond, four minus one. Here I have one, two, three. Four minus three would be one. And here I have two bonds to carbon. Four minus two is two. And finally, the last one, one bond to carbon, four minus one would be three. Oh, by the way, if I ever make a mistake on the board here, let me know so I can correct it. Because last time I checked, I don't walk on water unless it's frozen. Even then, I stay off it. All right, let's do the next one. One bond to carbon, there should be four. Three hydrogens. One bond again. Same here, same here, same here, same here. Now, let's look at that carbon. How many bonds are lines? Let's count. One, two, three. How many bonds to carbon? Four. Four minus three is one. Same thing here, same thing here. And that's how you know how to put in hydrogen. And that's the skill you should have. Let's see, it says seaboard, for example. Well, I did. Now, one of the amazing things about carbon atoms, it can form chains like this, because they're linked together, 
and that's how the name, I believe, the chain came about. Or you can have them hold hands or link together carbons one end to the other to form what we call a ring. And rings are represented by polygons. Poly means many, gone, sided. And Mother Nature and Dr. White love rings. Uh, my PhD thesis dealt with very specialized rings. And how do you draw a ring? Let's look at six carbons. This is not the way to draw a ring. You could. Here I have six carbons, and they're connected together in a circle. We call this a ring. How many bonds to carbon? Four. So if I look at each one of these carbons, it has two bonds to it. And that's one way of drawing it. Organic chemists never draw it this way. Why? Because we're lazy. And an easier way is called the line method. And the line method is every bend in a line is a carbon. And you don't show hydrogens. I said organic chemists are lazy. So how would I draw this molecule? Like this. Uh, by the way, have you ever heard people say I'm having a good hair day or bad hair day? Well, Dr. White has good ring drawing days and bad ring drawing days, and today's pretty good. I have software that does this when I make tests or slides or presentations. Now, this is a way each bend in a line is a carbon. How many carbons in this molecule? Let's count them. Same as this one. You don't have to know this. I do, and when I teach organic, the class learns it too. This molecule is called cyclohexane. Now, just to show you the real world, this, but Wikipedia, I can only say for chemistry, is very accurate. For organic chemistry, it's like 99.5 accurate, because many people like myself, when they first start doing this, police them, and I have the credentials that if I tell the Wikipedia to make a change, they will. And this is cyclohexane, it's a liquid at room temperature, and this is the main way of drawing it. This is another way of showing three dimensions. These are showing it models, which are, this is totally useless, this you make models yourself, and helps you understand the shape of a ring. And if you notice, this looks like a hexagon, because it is, and it's six carbons, and that's cyclohexane. Now, other rings Mother Nature likes is this one. How many carbons, I'm going to let you figure this one out. How many carbons in this ring? Everybody's going like this, so either you say you like me, or you figured out there are five carbons. And this is called cyclopentane. Whenever I see cyclopentane, I think of the little houses in Monopoly. It reminds me of that. And to show you uh, about organic chemists, we call these rings. How many carbons in that ring? No, it's not a square. In organic chemistry, this is a ring. Count every bond. And this is four carbons. It's called cyclobutane. Now, a different four-membered four ring is in penicillin, which I think one, many of you probably heard that name before. So you wonder, why are you learning these things? Well, these are in your everyday life. Now, do not copy this down, but this is 
called cyclooctane. It has eight carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Boy, I did it right. Eight carbons. Now it's time to find out he really is an organic chemist. When I come to a certain place on the road, I always think of cyclooctane. Where is that place? Every time I see a stop sign where I pull up to one, I think, oh, cyclooctane ring. And now you know I'm an organic chemist. Uh, let's see. Mother Nature mainly uses uh, five and six membered rings, a few four in molecules in our daily life. Organic chemists, I'm not sure I'm familiar. You call that a triangle, organic chemists call that a ring. That's called cyclopropane. And how many carbons in cyclopropane? That you should know how to figure. And look at every bed, one, two, three, and there are three carbons. But in many molecules we use in our daily life, you'll see rings like this. How many of you are familiar with a product that you probably use in the summer, which is called mosquito or an insect repellent? And the key ingredient in insect repellent uh, has a six-membered ring in it, and it's called D. And that's just the acronym for the organic chemical name. Now, one of the things you should know how to do is figure out how many carbons are in the following molecule. Now, sometimes write carbons, or if I remember, while you write that down. Again, tonight at midnight, I'll be giving you speed drawing lessons. I will. this Friday like I did last Friday after lab. I'll stick around if you have any questions or need help. Feel free to stay and ask. Alright, let's do some of these. Oh wait, I see you're still writing them down. How many carbons are in the molecule? That's always an important thing. One, two, three, four. So the answer is four. We look at this. So I'm not asking atoms. I'm asking carbon atoms. If we look at this one, there's one, two, three, four. Ooh, same thing. Now, this tells you there's a carbon carbon bubble bond in the ring, but it doesn't affect the number of carbons. Remember, ring, every bend in a line is a carbon. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. 
and you have, this is called the methyl group, which you won't need to know, and that makes seven, so that means there's seven atoms in that molecule. Now let me do a couple for you to try. I'm having way too much fun. I am. And the question would be, how many carbon atoms are in the following molecules? Have fun. I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. And the question is, how many carbons are in this molecule? Give you a big one to work with, but that's fine. And let's start, start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six. Don't count that. It's not a carbon. Don't count that. Seven, eight. And if I count it correctly, let's check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight carbons in there. Let's take a look at E. First of all, we have a ring. One, two, three, four, five carbons. Then six, seven, eight, not done, nine, ten. So this molecule has ten carbons. And that's something you should know how to do. How to count in a molecule how many carbons there are. Now, one of the good things about organic chemistry is organic chemists are lazy. And if we don't have to balance the chemical equation, we don't. We're just interested in what you make. Now, one, I'm going to show you a couple of general reactions. And these are always true. The first one, which we use in our daily life, is called combustion. And it switches on. And combustion is where you take a saturated hydrocarbon that can mean many different structures and react it with oxygen, 
with a heat source like a spark, and you get carbon dioxide, water, and heat. Now, you don't have to put down heat, I have it here, but that's combustion. Now, let's take a look at <coughs> the following. And this is the beauty of functional group chemistry and organic chemistry. Let's say three points each, you were to see the following. And the following is give the products for the following reaction. I could have also put inside if I wasn't lazy, the following reaction. So how do you do this? Well you look at what you're starting with. And what do we have here? A saturated hydrocarbon. How do I know that? I only have carbon and hydrogens and carbon and carbon single bond. and I've learned this general reaction. And I know when I react any saturated hydrocarbon with oxygen and a spark, what products will I get? Carbon dioxide and water. Also get heat, but heat is not considered a chemical product. And therefore, if I take this hydrocarbon and react it with oxygen, what am I going to get? Surprise, surprise carbon dioxide and water. And again, organic chemists, unless we have to, don't balance equations. The only time we have to is if you're doing calculations to determine how many grams or pounds of certain things you need to react together. In industry, that's called the charge weights to make a certain amount. Then you need a balanced chemical equation. Other than that, organic chemistry, net. And therefore, this is the reaction. By the way, you don't have to know this, but this is probate. And that's the stuff in the white tanks you use for your barbecue. And how many of you have ever seen, probably somebody might have done, or somebody's barbecuing with a propane barbecue? And what do they do? They light it, and there's a flame underneath. And this is the reaction that causes the flame. The flame is the heat, but carbon dioxide and water are also given off, but those are gases you don't see. And when you're running out of boardroom, we can make crooked arrows. And I'll let you try this one. What would be the product or products of the following reaction? There are eight carbons in case you're counting.
I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. When you're doing a reaction in organic chemistry, look at the starting materials, the reactants. What's unique about this? Well, I only see carbon, carbon single bonds, and only carbon and hydrogen atoms. So this is a hydrocarbon. And it's a saturated hydrocarbon. What am I reacting with? Oxygen. What do you get? CO2, carbon dioxide, plus water. And therefore, if I have this, this is a hydrocarbon. By the way, it has a name, octane. Octane is a component of gasoline. How many of you have ever seen at a gas pump where they have the octane number? And that came from back in the early 1900s when they were first selling gasoline and automobiles were quite interesting, crude, some of them. The best gasoline that gave the less problems for the engine had the most octane in it. And that's how the octane number has a, came about. Now, it's no longer true about half the weight of Gasoline is saturated hydrocarbons, and there are other molecules. But the octane number still is true. The higher it is, the better it is for high-performance cars. Octane, saturated hydrocarbon. Oxygen, what do you get? Carbon dioxide and water, plus heat. And that heat is what expands the gas in your cylinders of your car engine and make it run. So this is an important reaction. Now, how many of you have been out in real cold weather, you're on the road, and you see the car in front of you, and out his tailpipe, you see this liquid coming out. And you think, oh no, it's leaking gasoline. No, that's not what's happening. So what's happening is, when you have combustion, like you have in the car engine, that's why it's called a combustion engine, you're making carbon dioxide and water. Both are gases at the temperature that's coming out of your engine. Now, when the car first starts out, its tailpipe and muffler are very cold. And what happens is the gas form of water, called the vapor, is converted into a liquid. And that's what you see coming out of the tailpipe, which is this water. I wouldn't drink it, but it's still water. And that's how you know this is true. Oh, let's do another one. Let's have a pause. Can you guys keep a secret? Chemistry instructors, organic chemistry instructors, favorite trick on a test is to put a big, scary molecule if you don't know what to look for, it's big and scary. But if you do, it's not scary. And therefore, the trick doesn't work. And I teach my, I inoculate my students against that trick. Let's show you something. try this one out, what would be the product or products for the following reaction? Does that look like a big scary molecule? It's not even Halloween.
I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. Here's this big scary mountain. No, you look at it and say, what do you see? I only see carbon, carbon, single bonds. It's a single bond. Remember, every bend in the line is a carbon. I have carbons here, and this is a saturated. saturated hydrocarbon. What am I reacting with? Oxygen. What's the general reaction tell us? You get carbon dioxide and water. And here you get carbon dioxide and water. And that's the product or products. And you also get heat, but when we're talking about chemicals, heat is not a chemical, but it's an important thing. And this is the reaction that because of this, long wars have been fought on this planet to try and get oil, to get the hydrocarbons, to make gasoline or other things that we use in combustion. And that provides heat. Now, one more combustion reaction that I won't ask you to do. I'll do it if I get it right. CH4 is called methane. And you also know it by the name natural gas. If you react it with a spark and an oxygen, guess what? You'll get CO2 and water plus heat. And this is how you cook if you have a gas stove at home. This is how you probably, if you're in northern Illinois, most of the United States, heat your home in the winter because your furnace is a gas furnace that burns methane with oxygen to make heat and carbon dioxide and water. And it's important. Now, if this reaction isn't done properly, you also make carbon monoxide, which is a deadly gas. And that's why you should have carbon monoxide detector in your home. I do, and hopefully you do too. And if you have a water heater in your home or a condo or apartment building, which most of us do, like all of us, I would say 99.9% .9 of the people in northern Illinois burn methane to heat up the water so you can wash your hands with warm or hot water for your dishes. Now, one of the things students ask me is, how do you memorize a general reaction? You're going to need to learn two of them. Well, you don't need to, but if you want to do good on test four, you will. And the best way is write it down and say it five times. And I've done it a couple times, but on a piece of paper when you're alone or whatever, and you write down saturated hydrocarbon plus O2 makes CO2 plus water. And you say it. Now, if you're in the library, you can't say it out loud, but you can say it silently in your mind. You do that five times, and that burns it into your brain. Now, for this class, I'm only going to ask you to learn two. When I teach organic here or at the other school, there are about 55 reactions they need to memorize the whole semester. Now, me personally, I know about 450 general reactions. Now, general reactions are like to a carpenter, two by fours, sheets of plywood, nails, screws. Those are all things you can use to build things. And our organic chemists use that to build things. <coughs> now, let's talk about another very important general reaction, and that's called hydrogenation. And hydrogenation is the reaction of adding hydrogen with a catalyst to an unsaturated hydrocarbon. And for this class, I'll just limit it to a double bond. Now, the way I have it written there is R means anything with carbons. So this is a way of writing any molecule that has a double bond in it. Another shorthand would be this. The 
you have any molecule with a double bond and you react it with hydrogen in a catalyst, hydrogen gas. By the way, I should mention that organic chemists being lazy, sometimes if I have a reaction like this, A plus B plus C makes D, organic chemists, which I do without even thinking, will sometimes write it like this. These are the same things. And I've done it here, and I'll do it a little bit all the time. Oh, by the way, my habits I don't break, never change. Double bond with hydrogen gas and a catalyst. A catalyst is something you add that makes a reaction go quicker and does not get consumed in the reaction. And if I didn't do this, use a catalyst and did this reaction, come back in a year or two and it might move a little. If I do it with a catalyst at 140 degrees, it's done in four hours. How do I know that? Well, I worked on this reaction in industry, both as a bench chemist and as a manager and going out in the plant and managing and coming up with new procedures. And what you do is break one of the double bonds. It's called a pi bond, but I won't no. I mean, this won't be on the test ever or the final. A double bond is made up of two different types, a sigma and pi bond. Pi bond, I can break by that. Sigma bond, a single bond, you don't ever break except in combustion. It's very rare. So this is called hydrogenation. And what you do is you convert a double bond into a single bond. So let's look at an example. And the question would be, give the products. And actually, at this point, I might even write, give the organic products or product. Three points each. And let's take a look at this general reactor, this specific reaction. Now, Look at the molecule I just draw, true. You see something that's not a carbon-carbon single bond or a hydrogen? You see something yelling out at you? Look at me, I'm different. Double bond. And what am I reacting with? Hydrogen and nickel. Do you react to anything else? No. That's where the fun is, and that's what's the joy of learning functional group chemistry, because that's where the reaction happens only on functional groups except for combustion. And therefore, what I really see is this. Double bond, reacting with hydrogen and catalyst. Catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. And you break the pi bond, one of the bonds, each carbon gets a hydrogen. Now, one of the things I brainwash my students in organic chemistry, and I'll do the same here, actually two things I brainwash you. One is, I like my nonverbal communication, four bonds to carbon. The other thing I do is, do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No. I'll do it again in slow motion. Do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No. And therefore, if I look at this molecule, between these two carbons is a sigma bond, which is a single bond, but I'll break the pi bond. This is a single bond. I'm not going to break it. I start with three. I better end with three. Which carbons were the double bond? These two. 
I'm drawing the dots to bring your attention to it. Which carbons are here? These two. What is my general reaction? The two carbons double bond, you break the pi bond, each carbon gets a hydrogen. And now you put in the hydrogens. How many, hold on, wait, how many bonds to carbon? Four. So this has one, three, four minus three. Now, this one has one hydrogen plus two carbons, that's three. It needs another hydrogen. This one has one, two, four minus two is two. Now, on a test, you can write it this way, or you can combine these to do this. One plus one is two hydrogens on that one, two plus one is three. I tell students, do it this way. This one less thing you have to think about and get wrong. And that's how you do hydrogenation. Tiffany, you had a question. What do the dots represent? What? What do the dots represent? A way for me to focus your attention. And normally you wouldn't put them in there. This way, when I put dots and it says, look at these carbons. On a test, you don't have to do that. Okay? Another thing, have your attention. On a test, and when I teach organic, some of my top students always underneath the reaction they're being asked to figure out, write the general reaction. On a test, some of my best students in organic never write it, whichever one works for you. And that's how it works. Let's do it on. I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. Now, how do you do a problem like this? You look at the molecule and look for what's different. Ooh, double bond. That's the only thing that's different. What am I reacting it with? Hydrogen and a catalyst. And what can the catalyst be? Nickel, platinum, or palladium. Now, what happens, the general reaction is you take and break the pi bond. And now, what do we have happen? Well, first of all, do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? And the answer is no. So I have four cross, and I have a methyl group there. Now, Where's my double bond carbons? Right there. 
what happens. I break the double bond, and each carbon gets a hydrogen. Now, I have to put in the hydrogens. How do I do that? I know there are four bonds to hydrogen. And that's how you do it. Oh, let's do one more. These are fun. on this Monday morning. Remember Wednesday, I'll be going through the acids and bases problem set in here and finish this up. And then Friday, what I'll do is do the review for test four in the lab. And that way, we'll have Monday to do the organic problem set and do a little review. Looks like everybody's done. Let's take a look at this molecule. And the way you look at an organic molecule is you look for what's different. What's not a carbon carbon single bond? What's not carbon or a, a double bond? Is there anything else different in here? No. So as soon as I see that, the only see it, the thing I see is that functional group. I'm adding hydrogen and a catalyst. And the catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. And what happens, you break the one of the bonds, it's called a pi bond, but the other bond between those two carbons you keep, and each carbon of the double bond gets a hydrogen. Now, do you break carbon, carbon, single bonds? No. Therefore, I have one, two, three, four, five across. I'm going to end up with five across. Here are my two carbons double bond. I have two carbons here. By the way, those are called methyl groups. But you don't have to know that. And what happens? Notice I broke the pi bond. This is one of the bonds. And each carbon gets a hydrogen. And now the hard part, putting the rest of the hydrogens, how do you know that? There are four bonds to carbon. And that's the answer. And that's how you do hydrogenation. Now, when I teach organic chemistry more than general chemistry, I ask my students to do the following. You should be asking yourself, why am I taking this course? Why am I learning this? And for most of them, uh, the course I teach here and the other, they're in a health-related field that they're required to take organic chemistry for like getting into nursing school or other programs. And I say, well, the reason why is you want to get a good grade to get in that program. 
But in real life, why? Well, hydrogenation. How many of you have heard of hydrogenated fats and oil? And what they do is in the fat and oil, there's a carbon-carbon double bond. They react it with hydrogen catalyst, nickel, because the other two are too expensive to use in industry. Platinum and palladium are mainly used in pharmaceuticals. We have a much better what's called profit margin. And why do you do that? Well, if I take cheap corn oil or vegetable oil and hydrogenate it, corn oil or vegetable oil is a liquid at room temperature. A hydrogenated product is a solid at room temperature. I can mix it with water, some yellow coloring, and some flavoring, and sell it to you at margarine and make a lot of money. And they do. And um, unfortunately, hydrogenated fats and oils are bad for you, your heart. But companies don't care about that, a lot of them. Some do. And this is one thing, hydrogenation. There are other uses for it, too. And I've worked at companies where we've done hydrogenation of chemicals to make other chemicals. Now, switch is off for this slide. Where do you find organic chemicals? Organic chemistry. Well, all your fats and oils are organic molecules. That's organic chemistry. Carbohydrates are all, if you like having a piece of bread this morning, a potato, french fries, or potato chips, you know, dangerous stuff in life. Or if you like having sugar, those are all organic molecules. Proteins, if you have a steak, hot dog, or if you're a vegetarian, soybeans, those all are organic. Now, polymers, we did a little lab, remember? Polymers are where you link repeating units of certain molecules together to make big macromolecules. This monitor is a polymer. Look at the floor you're standing on. You have your feet on it. That's a polymer. The lenses to my glasses, they're polymers. It's not glass. And finally, steroids. How many of you have heard the term hormone? Another way of saying hormone is steroids, and those are all organic molecules. Let me show you two of them. Now that you know what to look at, By the way, did I tell you who this greatest of all organic chemists is? Mother Nature, by far. switches off, but I thought you'd like to see this. All right, first one, this is a structure called testosterone. It's a male a hormone, you know, counts for my beard and other things in men, and each bend in the line is a carbon. I didn't teach this, but each end of the line is a carbon. And notice you have three six-member rings. It's called fused together, but a five-member ring. And it has a functional group here, a double bond, an alcohol. And how this molecule does what it does in my body or yours, I have no idea. I'm an organic chemist. I know how to make it, how to react it. But how it does what it does, I know about, but I don't know how it does that. That's a whole other discipline of science. Now, not to be sexist, this is the molecule progesterone. And it's a female hormone. And again, it's found in your body, and it does certain things in a woman's body. And I'll let you look that up, because I'm an organic chemist. And here it's same ring system, 6665. In fact, all your hormones, or steroids, have that same, what we call, fused ring system.
this will never be on a test. And if you work in steroids, those are called the A, B, C, and D rings. Aren't they original? And every hormone, every steroid in your body has this ring skeleton as the basis for building the different hormones. And with that, I'll let you out a whole 15 seconds early.